Eh? Stop. So, before we start, I need you to imagine this scenario. Okay? You're walking down Main Street, going to the library. It's like 50 or 60 degrees, pretty cold for us Californians. And you turn a corner and you see this homeless guy on the street. And he, you can read his sign because you're walking towards him. So there's two words kill me. Now, what do you do? Can you go back a slide, please? Thanks. So, what do you do? Do you help him? Do you talk to him? Because the sign's pretty serious, right? Or do you just keep on walking and pretend you didn't see him? Because he's going to be irrelevant to your life in like 20 seconds. Now, a couple years back, I was cruising through middle school. Now, I did my good grades. I did my work. I got my good grades and kept my palpus off my pizza. And then I got this text. And to be honest, I was pretty shocked. I didn't expect someone else to confide in me. I mean, why would they? Has anyone ever confided in you? Why do you think they chose me and you over every other person on the earth? What makes us so special? Now, 15-year-old me, mature me, came up with some possibilities to this answer or this question. Maybe it's because I knew how to listen. Maybe it's because I wasn't a part of her family. Maybe it's because I was super good looking. Either way, um, I knew my response was critical, and I knew that whatever I would send, it had to be interpreted correctly and read in the right way to help her. She was in a rough situation. So, this is what I sent back. Just kidding. No, just kidding. Next slide, please. That's what I actually said. <laughs> um, but it turns out, when we started talking, that she was actually feeling suicidal. She was having suicidal thoughts. She was thinking about taking her own life. She had no one else to confide in. And this wasn't just a one-case scenario. After a while, I guess word spread about what I still consider to be a simple courtesy. And more and more people started confiding in me. There, it got to the point where I started receiving text messages or engaging in conversations where daily I would get someone who was suicide and saying that, hey, I want to kill myself. This was really hard. I kind of felt responsible for all of them. I kind of felt like I had to take care of them on top of my own life. And so I was balancing my own activities, my own schoolwork, and I was balancing their scenarios and situations. And when I mean they came to me with their problems, I don't mean just like, oh, I hate my teachers, or I feel sad. No, there was a kid who showed me her scars because she was doing drug use, because she was feeling lonely. There's another kid who came and was afraid to go home because he had abusive parents. There's even one kid who used to get bullied every day after school to the point where she attempted to take her own life by overdosing on pills. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them for feeling suicidal. In their situation, to them, what's the point of waking up the next morning if it's just going to be the same painful situation all over again? Trust me, I get it. To anyone in the audience feeling the same way, I get it. But there's always another way out. You know, it's so easy to compare ourselves. There's approximately 8 billion people in the world now. 3,200 of them who are at my school. Even with an infinite amount of people by someone's side, can you really stop them from preventing, or could you prevent them from really feeling anxious or self-hatred or even lonely? To me, I don't think so. Now, just for some context, taking the National Institute of Mental Health's definition, any mental illness is defined to be a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. And approximately 46.6 million adults or American citizens suffer from any mental illness. And once a mental illness starts limiting your life in major ways, that's when it becomes a serious mental illness. And serious mental illnesses can lead to suicide. Now, I'm sure we all know what suicide here. We know what it is, right? But I don't think we all understand how big of a problem this is. In 2017, in just the United States alone, there are approximately 47,000 suicides. 
And in comparison to comprehend how big of a number this is, there are only approximately 20,000 homicides in the same year. That means, statistically speaking, a dead body was more likely to have taken its own life rather than someone else. And when we look at the gender disparities here, females are actually more likely to take their own life or attempt to take their own life, but males are actually more likely to go through with it. In terms of suicide, three, males are 3.5 times more likely to commit suicide than females. And that's a really, really big difference. So it kind of makes you think about gender norms and how toxic masculinity makes males contain their own emotions. Um, I took a sociology class like two years ago at the local community college. My professor said something that's always going to stick with me. He said that no baby's born racist. And I think that's true. I don't think any baby is born with a harm or an, an thought to harm another person. I don't think any born, baby's born malicious. I don't think any of you guys are born malicious. And unless there's some biological difference, if we all start the same emotionally, how can we end up at different places? What gives me and you the right to be healthy or emotionally healthy? Whereas other people are suffering from anxiety, depression, OCD, ADHD, or even eating disorders. So keeping this in mind, I wanted to do something about this. You know, I couldn't keep all these problems to myself. I was burying the secrets of so many people and it got to me. So I made two really big important decisions in my life. One, I decided to be an upstander. And by being an upstander, I mean I applied to get my voice heard. I applied to the Mel Pearson Fight School District Board of Education, and I served as a student representative on it. That means that, we, by the way, we only have one school district in our city. So that means that all the administrators who were taking the decisions for the students or for the entire city, I got to have my voice and opinions heard. And I got to tell them that there was something wrong. My second important decision I decided to ask for help, and I got the help from them. So I want to see, first of all, was this problem only in my friend group, or was it for the entire community? You know, I had a pretty small sample size, so I went into survey with school. And with the help of ASB, yeah, you heard that correctly, ASB help, I surveyed the school, and it turns out over 75% of students knew someone or themselves suffered from a mental illness, and over 59% of the respondents claimed that they have suicidal thoughts. And that's a really big, that's a really big population. So we decided to do something about it, and we did all this work, all this change. But I'm going to keep it real with you guys. I'm not here to brag about what I've done, or the work that I've done. I'm not here to recite my entire resume to you. I'm here to share my story and spread a message across all these different people and across with all these different perspectives, I've come up with some conclusions, which I'd like to share. Next slide, please. Thanks. Thank you. Society lacks the ability to empathize. Our mundane lives are so distracting that individualism is valued over unity. In reality, every human action stems from the same fear of loneliness. You know, it's so easy to get caught up comparing yourself to other people. Our human actions are based off of our consequences, right? But our consequences, I believe, is based off of the fear of loneliness. We think that should we do this or should we not based on if it would be beneficial to us or harmful to us. And we think it's going to be beneficial or harmful based on if that's going to make us feel more lonely or less lonely. Let me give you an example. Let's say I robbed the bank. True story. I don't know. Just kidding. Uh, if I robbed the bank, my consequence would be going to jail. And am I really scared of going to jail? Am I scared of the prison bars and the prison food? Yeah, but I'm also scared of the loneliness I'll feel because of it. When if I go to jail, I'm going to be secluded from my sense of security, my home, my family, my community. And that's going to make me feel more lonely. 
If I go to jail and I'm a criminal, I'm going to be labeled as an outcast by society. I'm going to be singled out. And that's not going to help me relate to anyone else. That's going to make me feel more lonely. Next slide, please. Uh, let's say I asked out my crush, and she said no. Actually, she was Tori. Am I really scared of the rejection on my face? No, I'm not scared of rejection. I'm going to be scared of the loneliness I'll feel by losing a friendship. I'm now going to have this awkward friend zone relationship where I feel like I can't talk to them anymore. And that's going to make me feel more lonely. And worse, if anyone else finds out about it, finds out about it, and they make fun of me for it, then again, I'm an outsider from society. I'm being singled out. But fear not, I don't think that the fear of loneliness has to completely control us. I think there's some way we can prevent it and preserve our freedom. And I think that's by figuring out your purpose in life. And I'm sure you've heard of this, and then you know that it's really hard. For some people it takes years, for some people it even takes decades, but we can still do it. And don't feel pressured that you have to figure this out right now, this moment. No, you can still change your decision any time, even the rest of your lives to figure it out. And it's hard. I mean, what? it's hard to figure out and make a decision of what you want to dedicate your entire life to, but there's some ways you can do it. Just imagine. Imagine who you want to be. Imagine who you used to be. Imagine what you want to do and what you used to want to do. Figure out your purpose and never stop imagining. Because the day you stop imagining is the day that you die mentally. A lot of the kids who I talked to felt lethargic and unmotivated. And to them, again, what was the point of waking up tomorrow, right? If it would be the same pain all over again. Where having the purpose of even, your purpose can even be changed or making your own breakfast in the next morning. Having that purpose will make you want to do the actions, make you want to get up out of the bed, out of the bed. And having your purpose will make sure that your human actions are a result from your own will and not loneliness. It'll give you motivation to do stuff. A second way is by building community. And by building community, I don't mean like cities, states, or countries. I mean by being united, and not only being united, but feeling united. This is hard. This is hard to do. We're all, you know, we let the clock somewhere in this room dictate how long we can speak. And we let the clock in this room dictate what to do with our lives. In reality, every single one of us is just searching for the same feeling of belonging. We value individualism, because now it's so easy to compare yourself to the 8 billion other people in the world that you feel like you have to be better than someone to feel good about yourself. And that's not how it works. That's not how we're supposed to work. We should collaborate with each other instead of competition and trying to reach that one goal and seeing who, re who finishes the race first. We should help each other to finish the race together. And so how do you do this? How do you build community? How do, you, how do I give you the feeling of belonging? How do you give yourself the feeling of belonging? Where you kind of just have to be a good person to do this. Listen to other people's opinions and accept them for who they are, even if you don't agree with them. Respect their opinions. And be there for yourself, be there for your family, be there for your peers. Go out of your way to make someone else's day better, even if it doesn't benefit you. But it's probably going to make you more happy here, too. Value human relationships for empathy, rather than monetary or selfish values. There are 8 billion other people in the world, but... They're not all your enemies, and they don't have to be. Build a society and be an upstander so that the view or your perspective on society and the world can be the same as how you are as a child and adult. It takes you. No one else is going to solve your problems. No one else is going to go and do something for you. You have the power as a human being, and no one's going to take that away from you except yourself. 
to fight your internal doubts and conflicts to go out there and say, hey, I'm going to do something about this. Now let's go back to the scenario where the homeless guy is on the street, right? So what do you have to do now? Based on this talk, are you going to go and help him now? Are you really going to give him food and water? Probably not. But there is something you have to do. You do have to realize that even though he's alone on the street, he does have a voice. And even though he's alone on the street and you're surrounded here by your friends and family, you're probably more lonely than him. My name is Vyak Chatai, and I think we all feel lonely sometimes. Maybe it's time to do something about it. Thank you.